Bellevue, Nebraska. Danny Joe Everly left his home to run his morning paper route, and after a short time, customers began to complain that Everly's route was not finished. As Bellevue police investigated the disappearance, they found Danny Joe's bike with newspapers still folded neatly, leaning against a fence behind a dentist's home. A search team of over 130 officials began searching the immediate area for young Danny Joe, knocking on doors of the people along his route and searching other parts of the neighborhood that may have attracted him. But, sadly, nothing was found that day. The search continued for two days, and then on Wednesday, the body was found in a field just outside of town. Four miles away from his bike, Danny Joe Everly was found stripped down to his underwear, ankles and wrists bound with the rope. He had been stabbed nine times in both the front of his body and the back. Impressions had formed in Danny Joe's skin from pebbles, but not once found at the crime scene. Police scrambled to search for another spot which contained the types of stones as of those molded into Danny Joe's body. Later, the FBI was called in to investigate and sent in Robert Ressler of the Behavioral Sciences Unit. It became apparent to investigators that Eberle had been held captive for a period of time. His wrists were bound, he had tape over his mouth, and there was a pebble in his mouth that did not belong to the surroundings. Hair other than Eberle's had been found on the rope. Investigators scrambled to determine where the pebble had come from to find the primary crime scene. While the rope was being processed, Ressler built a psych report on the suspect. He concluded it was a young white man, probably who drove a tan car. He also concluded that since the murder took place in the early morning, the suspect probably had been up all night drinking. A suspect codenamed Alvin was picked up and interrogated. He had no alibi, failed a polygraph, and his hair sample was similar to that found on Danny Joe. But, Ressler and his team of psychologists believed that, that suspect Alvin was not the man. On December 2nd, two months after Everly's murder, Christopher Walden was walking to school when he disappeared. Witnesses say they saw him getting into a tan sedan with a white male. The witnesses were put under hypnosis and asked to give a description of the man. Although there were many anomalies between their stories and, in the end, it was discovered they got a lot of it wrong, the women were able to make a semi-accurate composition of what the suspect may have looked like. Two days later, Christopher's body was found by peasant hunters in a densely wooded area. He had been forced to strip and was stabbed several times. Footprints leading to and from the scene also indicated a single attacker. Seeking help from Scotland Yard, investigators searched all over the country for samples of rope trying to match the ones that they had found on the bodies. A preschool teacher noticed a car with a young white man driving slowly around her school. As she wrote the license plate down, the man allegedly got out of the car, forced her to give up the piece of paper, and threatened to kill her if she told anyone. The teacher called the police and the Chevy citation was tracked to a rental service at the local Air Force Base, where it was rented to John Jobert. It was found that Jobert used this red car while his tan car was in the shop. A warrant was issued and his house was searched, revealing specialized military rope consistent with that found on the body. John Jobert worked at Offlet Air Force Base as a radar technician. He lived a single life in the barracks on base, and while being interviewed, he appeared relieved that they had caught him, but he could not control the side of him that hurt the two boys. Jobert had had a rough childhood, his parents divorcing when he was six. He became the Woodford Slasher, attempting to stab or cut other people, and sometimes succeeding, but he was never caught. Jobert eventually confessed and was found guilty and sentenced to death. After many appeals, Gilbert was executed in a state of Nebraska prison on July 17, 1996.